Amen. Let heaven fall. And as heaven falls, Father God, we just worship you because you are beautiful. You are wonderful. And I would just like to invite you to take a seat because today what we are doing is we are having an open day. And today, the reason for this open day is because the scripture says, which Pastor Larry is going to and read for us now in 2 Corinthians 14. It says that we need to encourage each other. We need to build each other up and we need to tell of the great things that God has done. And because we look to the church, we are the church. And because people come to the house to, be get, to get built up and to get encouraged, encouraged and, and motivated and find hope and find peace, that, that, when, we, that when we come to the house, this is what we receive. And so we wanna show you today of the great things that people have, have, the great things that has happened in people's lives. And so to, to give God the glory, to give him the praise and the honor, because he is good. And to remember this, that when we walk into the house of God, we're not waiting for the anointing. We are anointed. So we bring the anointing into the house. And therefore we look to the future of the great things that God is gonna to continue to do in our lives through his word and through the testimony of those who he has done things for. Amen. So uh, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 26 in the CEB translation says this. What is the outcome of this, brothers and sisters? When you meet together, each one has a psalm, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All these things must be done to build up the church. How many know you and I are the church this morning, and God has a message for us today. He wants to build us up. He wants to strengthen us. He wants us to move forward with His grace with confidence that he is on our side. And uh, it's so interesting that uh, this word build here in the Greek is the word architecture. It actually uses the word edifice, which is a large imposing structure. And I believe that God wants the church to rise up and be an imposing structure in the midst of a fallen world, of a dying world, of a world that is full of challenges and, and, and missing the hope that God can bring to them, and that's you this morning. You're important to God, and so we're gonna have several people come and just share a scripture, a story, a poem, a testimony, and all that this morning is to build you up and to edify you and to encourage us that we can move forward. I just wanna say this, that uh, the prophecy that came out in the first service, and uh, it, it was so encouraging that God used Erica in this service, but it was simply this, we need to open our hearts to God. We need to allow God to speak to us and to do in us what he needs to do. And sometimes we're holding on to all sorts of things. We've got all sorts of things going on. And God was just saying, if we'll open our hearts to him. And on Wednesday night, uh, we had our small group celebration. And, uh, you know, we had an incredible time of just fellowship and fun and ministry and prayer and worship. But one of the gentlemen came to me after the service and he said, Pastor, I haven't been coming to your church long, but the series you've taught on open doors has really challenged me and ministered to me. But he says, you know what happened tonight? I was standing there in, in the church worshiping God and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and God said to me, I wanna open so many doors for you. But you know what the first thing is? You need to open the door of your heart to me. And, and the Lord showed him that he kind of opened the door to let Jesus in, but he was closing the door on everything else Jesus wanted to do. And he said this to me, he had such a glow on his face. He said, Pastor, tonight, I opened my heart full for Jesus to come in. Amen. And so uh, as the guys share this morning, open your heart and receive what God has for you today. Good morning, Moses. You might say, who's Moses? Wait. How many people in the house this morning are born again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking believers? I'm talking to you this morning. There's a number of buzzwords and phrases that have been doing the rounds in this country for a while. And one of those words is empowered. Now, a dictionary definition of empowered is this. Give someone authority or power to do something. Then the dictionary goes on and says it's a verb, a doing or action word. It's past tense, empowered, 
already happened. So if we look at Acts 1 verse 8, it says this, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But now we've already received the Holy Spirit. So we've got to look at past tense. Amen. And past tense, one, Acts 1 verse 8 would read like this. But you have received power when the Holy Spirit came upon you. And you should be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Church is not somewhere we go. It's something we are. We are called to go. We are anointed of God. And when people say, when they walk into a building, they say, oh, did you feel that anointing? The building is not the anointed thing. It's the people inside. We are the anointed ones. We are the hope of the world. We are the sons and daughters of God who, has, who, has, who he has sent into the world for a specific purpose, and that is to bring good news to the lost. We so often um, hear stories of people saying that God is our strong tower, our refuge, our protection over us, our shield, our buckler, and a hundred other things. And he is all of that, but he's also something else. He is our father. And as a father, we are his sons and daughters. And as sons and daughters, we've been sent to this earth for a specific purpose that he wants us to do. Now, if we want to know what that purpose is, all we have to do is look at our brother's life, Jesus. And in 1 John, verse, uh, 1 John 3, verse 8, it says, For this purpose was the Son of Man, man made manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So how do we do that? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 God has given us instruction and says, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. There's how you destroy the works of the devil. By reconciling man back to God. Oh, well, I don't know if I'm equipped to do that. You might say, well, you're highly possibly right. You might not be equipped. But the most ill-equipped person in the Bible for his life task, I think, was Moses. And Moses actually stood there and argued with God. Because he said he wasn't equipped enough. He wasn't able to. He wasn't this, he wasn't that, and he wasn't the other thing. And this is what Mo, uh, God said to Moses in Exodus, verse nine, uh, Exodus 9, verse 16. He said, for this purpose, there's that word again, for this purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. That sounds exactly like Acts 1, verse 8. Jesus' instruction to us. Acts 1 verse 8, but, I sh but you shall receive power. You shall be a witness to me to the ends of the earth. So in finishing today, all I'm going to say is, hello Moses, go out there and bring in the lost. Amen. Amen. Good morning, family, family of God. So good to see you. And it's a privilege to give you this poem. It was given to me um, by the Holy Spirit as I was thinking so clearly that in these days, people are always ready to say, Jesus is coming back on the 27th of September or whatever. But the Bible says, no man knows. Jesus doesn't know. The angels don't know. No one but God knows the hour or the time or the day that Jesus will come back. But he will come back. And so Matthew 24 verse 42 says, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. He shall come. It may be in the evening when the work of the day is done. And you have time to sit in the twilight 
and to watch the sinking sun while the long bright day dies slowly over the sea and the hour grows quiet and holy with thoughts of me. While you hear the village children passing along the street, among those thronging footsteps may come the sound of my feet. Therefore I tell you, watch. By the light of the evening star, when the room is growing dusky as the clouds are far, let the door be on the latch of your home, for it may be through the gloaming I will come. It may be in midnight when it is heavy upon the land and the black water lies dumbly along the sand. When the moonless night draws close and the lights are out in the house, when the fires burn low and red and the watch is ticking loudly beside the bed, though you sleep tired on your couch, still your heart must wake and watch in the dark room. For it may be that at midnight I will come. It may be at the cock crow when the night is dying slowly in the sky and the sea looks calm and holy waiting for the dawn of the golden sun which draweth nigh. When the mists are on the valleys, shading the rivers chill and my morning star is fading, fading over the hill. Behold, I say unto you, watch. Let the door be on the latch in your home, in the chill before the dawning between the night and the morning. I may come. It may be in the morning when the sun is bright and strong, and the dew is glittering sharply over the little lawn. When the waves are laughing loudly along the shore, and the little birds are singing sweetly about the door. With the long day's work before you, you are up with the sun, and the neighbors come to talk a little of all that must be done to call you from your busy work. Forevermore as you work, your heart must watch, for the door is on the latch in your room, and it may be the morning, and I will come. And so I am watching quietly every day. Whenever the sun shines brightly, I rise and say, surely it is the shining of his face. And look upon the gate of his high place beyond the sea. For I know he is coming shortly to summon me. And when a shadow falls across the window of my room, where I am working my appointed task, I lift my head to watch the door and ask if he has come. And the spirit answers softly in my home, only a few more shadows and he will come. Praise be to God. Amen. Morning, church. May I commend you? You are very much alive, much more than the first session. <laughs> so obviously this is why the pastor likes to hang around for this particular one. If, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alex, and I've actually been with this church for um, just over 10 years. I was kindly invited to the very first service by Pastor Larry, and uh, I've tried to stay faithful ever since. Uh, my story today is a true testimony to just how awesome God is and how he can work in your lives. But the most um, important thing you must do is believe. we all got faith, but if you don't believe that God can move mountains, you're not going to achieve what you want in life. Um, my tribes and tribulations started in May, when the enemy uh, got on the attack. Um, there's a major story involved in there, which I'm not telling you today. Maybe another day you'll get to hear it. But um, my finances took a heavy knock uh, when I had to pay a lawyer's bill for 10,000 rand. Uh, but God had always blessed me, and he'd given me work to do in Johannesburg. And uh, luckily, I went back up to Joburg and uh, succeeded to get stuck into work and focused on that. Uh, but the enemy certainly hadn't finished with me. Um, he knows that God blesses me, and he always has throughout all of my life. 
um, but uh, he was going to change things and stir things up just a little bit. So on the way back from Johannesburg, I got as far as Warden, and my bucky decided uh, for the engine to die. So there we are now, we're stuck in Warden, and I'm thinking, what can I do? Um, so I'm praying. Uh, we, luckily, we stayed uh, in, a, in, a, in a guy's flat overnight, and I thought, okay, let me, let me reach out to a friend of mine in Durban, um, who also was touched by God, and he actually drove through to Warden to pick us up and bring us back to Margate. And my bucky was now sitting in Warden uh, with a broken engine. I, I had just enough finances to pay for the parts and got those shipped up. Uh, but I had no funds left at all um, to actually pay for the labor for the work to be done. So my wife and I, um, we sat down and we prayed together, which is the best way. If you're a couple, pray together. It's the strongest way to pray. And God will always listen and he'll pay heed to what you're asking. And we asked him for finances. I couldn't see a way out really because I had no more work in, in the schedule. Um, but I just had faith and I believed. And because of that, we've got friends in Johannesburg that we've known for 17 years. And we only see them periodically. And the last time we actually saw them face to face was three years ago. But they used to phone about every three months just to touch base with my wife and ask her, you know, how's things, etc., etc. Tell us what was going on in their lives. And my wife unfolded the story of the tribulations that we'd had since May and how it had ended up with my bucky uh, being stuck in, in Warden. And they asked, they said, you know, well, you know, if we can possibly help you, um, how much would it cost to get the bucky safely back home? And I said, well, you, you're looking, we're looking at a bill of around 12,000 rand, which is no little amount. And they said, ooh, it's a bit much. We don't know if we can... I said, listen, we're not asking you for anything. You know, we're just trusting in God. And they go... We'll see what we can do. Two days later, 12,000 rand appeared in my account. Okay, so you must believe. So if any of you are going through any sort of trials and tribulations, just ask God for his help. Pray as a pair if you can, but he will listen. Amen. Morning, everyone. If I had my life over to live over again, I would not be afraid of more mistakes. I'd try more, do more, and learn more. I would relax more, be sillier, and take a whole lot of things less serious. I'd take more trips, climb more mountains. I'd swim more rivers and watch more sunsets. I'd eat more ice cream and less cabbage. I'd have fewer imaginary troubles and be more real to myself. If I had my life to live over again, I wouldn't want any amazing moment to slip away. I'd walk more and drive less. I'd pick more flowers and laugh more, appreciate the little things. I won't waste the moment or miss out on any opportunity. But you see, we were given only one. Make sure today to make the one given count. The purpose of having a life is to live it. Too often people are already dead before they die. Too often we give up on our dreams because to others it seems and sounds far-fetched. Too often we wish upon a star. Stop wishing and start praying. Stop wasting your energy on senseless drama and start writing down your vision. Build your relationship and focus on your relationship with your Creator. God is on your side and He wants us to reach our full potential. Walk with Him. Talk with Him. Ask and you shall receive in Jesus' name. Trust and you have faith in God to guide your footsteps. Don't ever rely on your own strength. We weren't placed on earth to merely get through life. The most important thing in life is to find out what God wants for your life and go out and do that. 
Live in his love and experience his presence. Be an active part in your relationship with the Father. Don't think less of yourself than God thinks about, of you. Pick up that chin and move forward. Serve Jesus as Jesus served his people. He gave us the ultimate sacrifice on the cross so that we can have the ultimate life. Live it. Don't allow the enemy to steal what God has granted us. I want you to ta- today to make a choice set before us in Deuteronomy 30 verse 19. Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make, or that you would choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Today we make a choice, life or death, blessings or curses. Jesus buried death and washed curses out with his blood. We are through Jesus in right standing with God. We are his chosen people. Make sure to experience the brilliant things life gives and thank God for those irreplaceable things. Live life to the fullest. Live to fulfill God's plan and purpose for your life and to glorify his name. The clock is ticking. The hour is near. Live today as if today is your first day in God's service and the last day on earth. To be is to do, and to do is to do now. Now, today is available. Now is the time to forgive, to love, to live. And now, today, is the time to give your all to Jesus. For our God knows the plans he has for us. Don't hold back. Be who God made you to be. Not tomorrow. Today. We are appointed for a time like this, stop being me and start with, I am. Thank you. Morning, guys. I want to thank the Rema family, Pastor Larry and Pastor Mandy, for giving me this opportunity. I'm here to share my testimony and to thank God for his awesomeness in my life. My name is Jeremiah Kwasabrika. I'm from Nigeria, Lagos. I came to South Africa to learn how to fly because I think the the prospect of being paid to fly is awesome because I love flying. I came, when when I came to learn how to fly, the funds and everything wasn't a problem, so I did uh, my PPL. PPL is a beginner course. And after your PPL is a commercial course, that's when you get paid to fly. I finished my PPL. I got my license. And after that, things changed. My passports got uh, expired. My visa got expired. Couldn't get a job. Things were hectic. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know how I was going to get out of it. But this last month, so many things have been happening, but this last month, in like two weeks, my family from Nigeria, my cousins just called. I'm like, hey, you know what I'm going through, and they're going to pay for it. I mean, we have pilot courses in excess of 300 and some thousand rands. So without a job, I didn't know. <laughs> So they called and they were like, hey, they're going to pay for it. Not only did they do that, they also paid for my passport, paid for my visa, for me to renew everything. And then even before I even got back from doing all of that, someone called me on the phone and was like, hey, he's got a job for me. I was like, what? <laughs> me? <laughs> you know? So I'm here to talk with my brothers and my sisters to you guys to help me. Thank God. It's been awesome in my life. And Well done, Jeremiah. I want to just add to that story uh, two little parts that he didn't share. Firstly, over the last year in what he was going through, 
he never let his attitude or his countenance drop. As a matter of fact, if you saw him here on a Sunday or during the week, you wouldn't have even known he was going through anything. You wouldn't have known that some days he didn't even know where his next finances would come for food or for resources. Number two, what he did is he volunteered in the church. He made himself available and he served with joy and with passion. He said, Pastor, if you ever need anything, phone me, whatever it is, I'll do it. And I phoned him on two or three occasions. He came and helped us clean the chairs. He helped us with some of our outreaches. And he really just kept his attitude in a positive place despite being in a difficult situation. And you remember about six weeks ago, we started praying for those people who are unemployed, who are looking for jobs and opportunities, and for God to turn situations around. And literally within two weeks from that, these doors started opening, and his whole situation radically turned around, and God came through for him in what he was trusting God. So can we just give Jesus praise in the house today? Morning, church. Isn't it amazing all the testimonies? God is on our side, amen. Um, at the beginning of the year, I asked the Lord, how can I be of better service? And the Spirit just revealed to me, encourage, encourage, encourage everyone around you. So I just want to thank you for this opportunity to share and encourage in the beginning of the school holidays in April, my youngest son, 12 years old, went on to a school rugby tour in Durban. They departed the Monday and were scheduled to come back the Thursday evening. And then the Friday morning, they would leave again uh, for him representing his rugby club um, in Glenwood. And they would return back the Sunday. So every morning while I was on tour, obviously being a parent, we would spend some time in prayer just praying for protection over him and his, and his team, that they will enjoy their time there, that they will behave, um, and exercise good sportsmanship for him as he grows to build a good character to become the person God intended him to be. And then also just giving God all the praise for what he has blessed us every day. So on the Wednesday morning while spending time praying in tongues and committing my son in prayer, the Spirit showed me my son getting hurt. I saw him getting hurt from, from the neck up, which indicated to me a very serious injury. My, my first reaction was, no, it can't be. My mind is just playing tricks on me. So I continued in prayer and asking, <laughs> And I asked the Lord, Lord, is this true? You see, the enemy had planned an attack on my son. And as I kept on asking when and when will this happen, it was revealed to me this Saturday morning in Durban. We have already planned to go to Durban and watch him play that day. To be honest, I was devastated and a total wreck. I didn't want to say anything to Lunette because she was at that, stage, at that stage also fighting a spiritual battle. And as the days followed, uh, she noticed something was wrong with me, but I just said, look, I miss my son and uh, just keep him in, in your prayers as well. I didn't want it to get worked up. What I actually hoped for that was that I was wrong about this whole thing. Only my imagination so eventually the time came where I had to make the decision, am I going to allow my son to play or am I going to pull him out? The thing was, if I, <laughs> if I had to explain to him what's going to happen, I'm sure he will never play rugby again in his life. He loves playing rugby and not because he's my son, but he plays with such a passion and dedication He's focused, he trains hard, and it plays. Sport is a huge part of his life in this stage. So, my decision was he is going to play no matter what. He will play, and I will pray. Amen. You might think, what type of father are you? How stupid can you be to put your son in harm's way? 
Even worse, you are doing it knowingly. They actually need to revoke your father's license. Church, we will most of the time have to face battles in our life. And I think God would have honored my decision to back down. To say, Lord, I'm not going to be able to handle this situation. It's too much for me to carry. But I've learned through my past the regret of backing off instead of facing the battle and pushing through would have haunt me for the, forever. The fact that I'm believing with my whole being that God is faithful, that my faith and trust is in Him. No matter what circumstances I face, He will come through for me and you. Amen. So as this dreadful Saturday came closer, all I could do was to pray and worship. Pray and worship. And lift up the name of Jesus. At night, I couldn't sleep, so I would carry on praising and worshiping and declaring God's faithfulness towards me and my family. So that Saturday came, and as the second half of the game started, a freak accident happened. My son and another player ran on full speed in, into each other. They fell to the ground and didn't stand up. The medics ran onto the field to attend to them, my legs were like jelly. <laughs> As I ran onto the field, it was, no, Lord, this can't be. <laughs> but then, <laughs> apart from just a broken wrist, he was still perfectly fine. <laughs> he actually told the medics, leave the ice on, strap my wrist so I can carry on playing. My team needs me. <laughs> the other player that got hurt received injuries to his head and mouth. And uh, we visit him in the casualty rooms. He was next to my sons. So we declared the blood of Jesus over him and we prayed for him. And he also uh, didn't sustain any major injuries except for a few stitches to his mouth. My son went the following Tuesday in for an op the Tuesday. And we had such good favor with the surgeon that you couldn't even see where his wrist was broken. His wrist healed in half the time it was supposed to be. So this morning, with you being my witness, I just would like to, to say thank you, Jesus, for your divine protection and healing over my family. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for revealing to me the schemes of the enemy so I could step into my war room and pray and prepare for this battle. And Father God, I give you all the glory and honor and thank you for your faithfulness. I would just like to close with this scripture. It's in Philippians 1 verse 9 to 11, which reads, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruits of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Awesome. Thank you so much. Good morning, church. I greet you all in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord and Savior. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Brendan, and I'm here to share my testimony of life and death with you guys. About five years ago, and uh, on any normal weekend it was, um, I traveled to Durban to see my family. For the preceding days, I had a few, you know, symptoms, you know, kind of like the flu or any upper respiratory infection. And um, to cut a long story short, on that Saturday, I ended up walking into a public bathroom um, at the hotel that I was staying at. And uh, I remember facing myself in the mirror, grabbing my chest, and waking up in hospital. That was the last memory that I have. I woke up in ICU on ventilation with tubes down my throat and um, I couldn't really breathe for myself at that stage. And I remember waiting for one of the super specialists to come in because the case was that severe at that stage. Um, so he came through and he stood at the foot side and he took out my chest x-ray. And being a doctor myself, when he put up 
that x-ray, I realize the chances are I'm not going to walk out of here. And you lose even more faith when your specialist looks at the x-ray and goes, then you know you pretty much don't stand a chance. <laughs> so anyway, he turned around, looked at the nurses and said, look, let's just give him everything. Give him antifungals, antibiotics, whatever we have, just give it to him and let's see what happens. Basically, at that stage, you know, my chance of survival was almost zero. That night, my heart stopped twice. They needed to perform CPR. And for the ensuing two days, I was, was really touch and go. Being a pastor's son, the greater part of Durban was out there praying for me, including my father who prayed the blood of Jesus over me every single day. And the doctors decided that they were possibly going to have to do a, a scope for me because they had no other option. They did call in my family and say to them that the scope carries almost a 95% possibility that he's not going to survive. And that day, my father began to pray fervently, and so did the rest of the people in Durban. At 1 o'clock, I was due to go for the procedure. At 12.30, my saturations improved. My temperature started to get better, and I started to make a dramatic improvement. Three days later, I was off the ventilator. And five years later, I'm here in front of you to say that God did not only restore me and give me life, but now he's given me life more abundantly. What the canker worm tried to take away, I have even more of. Today I have a beautiful family, a beautiful wife and child, and I stand here only because of the blood of Jesus. So whatever it is that you may be facing in life today, be it health and the doctors that say it can't be, and I'm a doctor and I'm telling you, if the doctors say it can't be and you're not going to do this and you're not going to do that, the blood of Jesus. Financial, the blood of Jesus. Every part of your life that you're struggling in, nothing but the blood of Jesus will set you free. Thank you. Amen. Come on, look at the person next to you. Say, you are an overcomer this morning. <laughs> Come on, say, I can do it, can do it. through the grace of Jesus. Grace of Jesus. Say, I'm going, I'm going over and not under. Not under. I'm, above I'm above and not beneath. Not beneath. I, believe I believe it. I declare it, I declare it. in Jesus' name. Jesus. Now, today has been all about encouraging our faith helping us to see that no matter what we're facing, God is bigger. God has a different picture to what you and I have on a day-to-day -day basis. And so no matter what you're facing, if you'll look to God, if you'll look to Christ, if you'll look to the inward man, like Rob shared, he will empower you to get through what you're going through. And so I wanna share a scripture with you as we close this morning uh, from Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 and 11. But before we do that, I want you to know that uh, uh, Dr. Brennan could also share testimony of his own family, uh, where his own mother-in-law was in absolute jeopardy for her life and, and also almost gave her no chance. But God put the right people in the right place, and his supernatural power delivered her and brought her to complete healing. Uh, many others of us have different testimonies. We could probably spend the whole day and each one of us have a story to share. And I want to encourage you to hold on to and remind yourself of those victories. Um, myself and my own family, this, uh, the past two weeks, discovered that my dad had been diagnosed with a, uh, a cancerous tumor in his right breast on the right side of his, uh, of his arm. And uh, it was aggressive and it was growing by the day. And my dad, being who he is, just simply got into the word, declared his faith, my mom did the same, and so uh, on Thursday night, he went in for an operation, and 
uh, the surgeon had said, listen, it's quite a dangerous operation. You know, there are quite a lot of muscles and nerves, and if, if we touch one of those, it could affect your arm permanently. And uh, so they did the operation, and what we discovered, and, and my dad literally prayed this because he didn't want to go in for an operation. He's never been to hospital. He's never been put under anesthetic, and he was, had to deal with the fear of that. And then he came to it, he said, Lord, uh, I'm gonna listen to what the doctors are saying. I'm gonna trust you in this. I'm gonna surrender my fear to you. And I believe you're gonna prepare whatever needs to be prepared so this operation is a success. And in the three days before the operation, he literally saw the tumor, which was now starting to extend, he literally saw it move day by day. And it moved into a position so that when the surgeon did the operation, he never had to cut any nerves, any muscles, and he had such a speedy recovery. Uh, Dr. Brennan actually said to me, listen, your dad's probably going to be in hospital for three or four days because they need to drain you know, all the poison and all the stuff. It's a very dangerous part. And by Friday morning, the surgeon was amazed at my dad's recovery at 82 years old, said to him, listen, go home. You're doing so well. That is the faithfulness of God, amen? So verse 10 of Revelations 12 says this, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives unto death. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. We heard this morning, use the blood of Jesus over your life, over your family. Get up every morning and declare it. But not only that, testify of what God is doing, what God has done, and what he's going to do in your life because his word is true. I want to encourage you as you go out this week, remember you are an overcomer. This week, allow the Holy Spirit to bring God's word to your remembrance. Each morning as you're on your way to work, as you sit and have your quiet time, our prayer for you is that you'll experience God's healing power in your soul, in your spirit, and in your life as you meditate on the scriptures, as you declare the blood of Jesus over your mind and over your life, that not only will you see a turnaround in your life, but as you begin to share that with others, your friends and those you come in contact with, they too will experience the life-giving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm gonna ask you this morning, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around.